that's working. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So for our next case study, um, some some of you may have heard of the um, the uh, big new broadcast center being uh, built in Cardiff, and um, we had a really good session about this a, a year ago, where we were hearing about a lot of plans. Uh, now I'm hoping that we're going to hear about a lot of uh, results and, and real-world situations. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Mark Patrick from the BBC. Hi there, everyone. My name is Mark Patrick, uh, lead architect for Major Projects Infrastructure, which is the de department within the BBC which is delivering the new building in Cardiff Central Square. So as Wes said, we've, you know, we've been around the block a few times with updating where we're heading. And we're now in a position where we are ready to go live um, just after Christmas. We, in fact, the first people move into the building, the non-technical users move into the building in the next few weeks. So just a brief overview of what we're doing and BBC Wales. BBC Wales is um, a subsection of the BBC based in Cardiff and covering uh, transmission output for all of Wales. Um, if people aren't aware of where Wales is, it's one of the uh, nations that makes up the United Kingdom and also a unit of measurement. Um, <laughs> and we've got three TV stations. BBC One and BBC Two have a Welsh version in English, but, but with um, localised content at certain points of the day. And S4C, which is a Welsh language uh, station, which is coming in, co-locating with us in the new building. There's Radio Wales and Radio Cymru, which is the Welsh language radio. And both of them have got additional networks. So there's up to four networks which can originate from the building with a number of different geographical opts. We've also got online contribution. There's an orchestra, not that that really participates in the move to 2110, and an awful lot of 20, uh, 2110 based production facilities in the region of 30 edit suites. It's one of our largest newsrooms as well, outside of the main one in London. And a lot of the very high profile output from the BBC, like Doctor Who, Sherlock, um, and rugby, of course, originates from Cardiff. So it's a very important centre of the BBC. So the site is in the city centre, it's adjacent to the railway station, adjacent to the university, near to the stadium. Um, it's a catalyst of development in the city centre. I'm told in the region of a billion pounds of development because we've come in and it's, it's, it's moved things on in a part of the city centre that was languishing behind the other areas of the city. I won't linger on this slide, anyone can download this, it's too small to read, but the facts and figures uh, are there. The highlights are we've got... Um, one large general purpose um, TV studio with AR, a flexible production area, um, a VR AR news studio, a smaller news studio, 22 uh, edit suites, dubbing theatres, track length suites, multi-purpose areas, flexible areas, huge number of audio workshops and radio studios. So we've got everything. We also do our own transmission from there, so we've got playout suites on, on site. So it's a little bit of everything. So. Before I go back into the details of 2110, these photos were taken just a few weeks ago, and this is where we're at. We are very, very near to the end of the installation. We're in user acceptance testing and ready to go live in Q1 next year. So there's a picture of our studio. As you can see, it's a large space, slightly lower height than traditional BBC studios. It's, it's a new development. It's city centre, spaces of a premium. And you can see that we've got a lot of... Um, if I just, I'm told I shouldn't point at the screen, so I'll move my mouse instead. We have a lot of these flexible areas which can be used for meetings, for breakout groups, or for production. And we've got connectivity, fibre connectivity, all through the building, so we can take cameras and microphones, connect them over IP from those areas. Down the bottom here, that I've got better pictures of this on, on future slides, but this is the live core. This is the, the core um, uh, control systems from Grass Valley and, and Cisco. These are the spine switches. And then over here, you see a number of our GV nodes, which is one of our adaptation units, and also hosts the multi-viewers. Over on the right here, one of the first instances of pictures coming up live over 2110. This is a few months ago when we first spun up the pictures. Um, so, yeah, we're, we've made a great deal of progress over the last year since we last presented. Another view looking down, you can see the open plan nature of the building. This is a key design feature of the building, to be open and accessible. And in fact, that, that atrium you can see at the bottom is public space that's open to the public some of the time. Not all of the time. We can control it as necessary for security. But the building is open and accessible to our, our, our viewers and really opens up new ways of working. The studios fold out into that area. We can use the building as a set, and that's part of the design. And the move to IP and the flood wiring of the building with fibre is what facilitates that. 
So opportunities, this is a slide some people will have seen before. It's worth recapping you know, where we've come from. The opportunities we saw um, moving into the new building, new technology enables us to support new ways of production, new creativity, uh, new flexibility. As I mentioned already, the open plan nature of the building is important. And flexibility is key. We've, we've put in a lot of infrastructure to allow the building to be used in new ways. The caveat I'd throw in there that perhaps wasn't apparent when we started this journey, that flexibility brings with it complexity, particularly in the control system. It's a lesson we've learned, and I'm happy to pass on. You, know, you don't get flexibility for free, and the, the cost of it is making it work easily for the end users. Um, as you've seen on the previous pictures, audience engagement is something that's uh, opened up in a whole new way. The old building doesn't have that setting. It doesn't work in that way. It requires new skills. These the challenges we've got. New, new technology brings with it new, new skills. We've had to upscale a whole load of staff. We've had to recruit new people. There's been a, a huge development of the skill sets needed. And don't forget the old skill sets, lining up the audio correctly, doing the color balance correctly, doesn't go away. IP just brings another couple of tiers on top of that. Um, but we found some good people. We've got good people working on, on it with us. Change can be difficult. Um, the new technology is a bit I'm focusing on, and you know my job is change. I'm used to change, but not everyone embraces change in the same way. Some people are threatened by it. But it, don't forget the simple things. And in a project like this, moving a whole building, it's things like changing the commute for people, changing the fact they've been able to drive a car in and park it to the fact it's city centre, there's no parking, they have to use the train. These are big, life-changing things for people, <laughs> and they, they worry about it. Um, so never mind the technology change. You know, don't forget, on a big project like this, you've got the whole suite of things to work about. And we've had to balance the um, access from the public with security. And the move to IP has caused us to have a complete rethink about the way we deal with information security. And I've come on to this in a, in a few slides' time. But actually, the focus has been on our control systems and our control network more than the media network. Because the media network is contained, it's high speed, and we've got the Cisco DCNM SDN system which controls the flows on the network and actually gives us a good degree of security out of the starting block. So some of the achievements since last year, um, not directly related to the, to the technology, but actually linked in more ways than you'd expect because the design of our apparatus rooms was pivotal to this. We've been certified the, with the building having a BREAM outstanding rating, which is pretty unusual in the UK and very unusual within the broadcast sector. So that's a, a real achievement that we're, we're very pleased about. We've placed all our contracts um, a long while ago now. Um, we've worked through all the designs. We're, we're finalizing things now on, on the testing and installation. Um, we've moved to virtualization. I don't really go into this in the great depth here. It's, a, it's a, a topic for another day. But we've pretty seamlessly moved to virtual platforms for a lot of our broadcast systems, including all our control systems. There's been a few ups and downs, a few lessons to learn, uh, uh, making sure it's backed up and so on. But largely, that's been a, a, a smooth journey. Um, our apparatus rooms have taken on board, as, as part of why we got the BRIAM award, we've got a much more efficient approach to power distribution and to cooling, and we integrated the hot hour containment from the outset. It was actually done for us by the builders, so we haven't had to fit that into a room later on. It's, it's part of the fabric of the building. As I say, we're now in testing. These, these pictures are only a few weeks old. You know, this, this is where we're at. We're, we're pretty much ready to go. Just a reminder on where we are with IP and the pros and cons of IP, and we weighed all this up. Back in 2016, I came back from NAB um, with colleagues, and we decided we'd go 2110. Now, now that seems like, yeah, so what? Everyone's doing 2110. Don't forget, in 2016, 2110 wasn't ratified. That's a very brave step for anyone, and it's especially brave for a public service broadcaster the size of the BBC, traditionally quite risk-averse. So we took on a lot of risk, and we didn't take it on lightly. We did a lot of evaluation. But the benefits we get, future-proofing, um, flexibility, you can already see how with the flexible layout of the building that moving to IP, IP gives us that way to work the building in ways we haven't foreseen. It was obvious when we set out that it was going to be the industry standard. It was, we weren't exactly sure which bits of the stack would land in which order and we didn't have the pyramid to turn to when we started. So um, it was clear though that if we didn't do IP we'd be building a building that was built on legacy foundations. Um, and eventually, it's COTS. Don't forget that the shelf in COTS is a very high and expensive shelf at the moment, but the, it's a downward tra trajectory for costs all the time. And if we, you know, if we didn't do this, we'd be out of line with the movement within the industry, and that's not somewhere we want to leave a new building. But it comes with risks. So interoperability, it's coming together. And actually, I have to say the video and audio, particularly the video interop, 
pretty much just works. You tease out a few problems and it works. It's around the control that we've had problems and it's around integrating radio and TV workflows and standards into one building that we've had, we've had issues to tease out. There's an obvious cybersecurity risk. We've brought in expertise both within the BBC from our cybersecurity team and from the government who've been able to help us with making sure that we haven't left any, any pitfalls on the security. We've had to upskill and support new skills. That's a big risk. It remains a big risk. That, you know, we'd always b benefit from more people and more skill. And um, we recognise we might need more resource and more time to deliver. And yeah, we, we have had to work really hard to, to get where we are. The other thing, which is a problem for um, our accountants more than for me as a, a project engineer, um, the refresh cycles are a lot faster. So traditionally, you don't refresh the core infrastructure for maybe 15, 20 years. You know, we've all got SDI routers in a cupboard which are still working a long while after they were put in. That isn't going to be the case. You need to be able to manage refresh faster and also get used to embracing firmware updates and software updates on a much more frequent basis than we historically do. And you have to build the systems to do that. So we awarded our main contract to Grass Valley. Um, we've worked out a network topology for our control system and also the um, media networks, and I've got a couple of slides coming on on that. Our control is from BNCS, and we've virtualized that. Our 2110 networks are built on Cisco fabric, and then we've got quite a lot of gatewaying to SDI. We've still got quite a lot of SDI on the edge, a lot more than I'd like, but I think we have to recognize where we started and where we've got to and the timeline. We're not quite aligned in time with the bulk move by all the different vendors to 2110. Um, we've got a mixture of GV nodes and UCP. So we're using GV nodes where we need bulk conversion all in the standard um, 1080i house format, and we're using UCP where we need more flexible arrangement for different formats. So in post-production, we need to be able to flex the video format, and we, we're using the UCP for that. An area that's just worked pretty much from day one is multi-viewers. Moving multi-viewers to IP just gives you so many benefits. The flexibility of not being tied to how you route things into a given multi-viewer. We can literally nest the multi-viewers. If we're mad enough to do it, you can route multi-viewers into multi-viewers into multi-viewers, and it just works. We've done an awful lot of testing. We've had four rounds of formal testing, all linked to the contracts, and infinite numbers of informal testing and, and findings and fixes. Um, and the final commissioning and the final you know, firmware updates and so on, as you'd expect, are in progress as we speak. Over on the right there, the pictures show the spine switch. Um, just worth pointing out, each one of those fibers is running at 100 gig. And that's, it just works. I mean, when I was at university, a 56K modem was fast. And you know, the idea that we can run at 100 gig is mind-blowing when you stop and think about it. But it does just work. It's not something to worry about. So here's the architecture of our media network. We've got a dual system, an A and B network, we're using Dash 7, and everything we connect onto the video media network has to be Dash 7 capable. We've got a spine leaf system, um, two spines, one on each side, and 12 leaf switches. Um, there's Cisco 9508 in the spines and 9236 uh, on the, uh, the leafs. Um, as I said, everything connects um, using 100 gig. MPO optics between them, uh, again, that's quite a novelty. We had a few uh, gotchas with some of the fiber connections and the fact that single mode MPO is quite unusual in the data center world because they use multi-mode and you have to get it right. Um, we're using Cisco DCNM, which is their version of SDN, to control the flow policies on the network and that gives us security and it also gives us non-blocking. We engineered this network to be non-blocking. We could save money in the future on another future project by engineering in blocking, but at this stage that didn't feel like the right uh, balance of risk. So this network is non-blocking comes at a cost and comes at a size. Not right for everyone to do that, but for us, that was the right decision. And we've got those leaf switches distributed across the floor. Uh, every floor has at least a pair. So this is another view of the same sort of thing. You can see the leaf spine architecture up here at the top. And then this is a, a summary of the things we've got connected. So first off, there's a pool of directly connected equipment. And that's GV, Kahuna Vision Mixers, Sony CCUs, uh, tech Prism and Fabrics, which we're using for monitoring and testing. Calrec audio desks, they connect both in 2110 and also on AS67, which is something I'll come on to in a minute. Um, Dalet, EVS, Viz, a few other systems I haven't called out. Apologies if anyone's here I've missed off the list. Um, then we've got the mix. Uh, actually, it's now the UCP, uh, so it needs updating, but the, the IQ frames and the node. That's bringing in all our other systems. It's feeding all the, s the s monitors and so on, where we're still beholden on SDI or sometimes HDMI for the monitor feeds. Um, 
We're using the nodes also for the multiviewers, so the multiviewer cards are hosted in the node, and we've also got a couple of nodes dealing with audio. And then over on the left-hand side, this is one of the big lessons we've learned, and one of the areas where we've had to deviate from the original design of the, the network architecture. We wanted to have everything on that network. We haven't been able to get the audio onto that shared network. There's two reasons for that. Firstly, AS67, it would behave on that network, but don't forget we've got an AB network, and our InfoSec people were very keen that we never bridge them. You know, we, we genuinely keep them separate networks. Very few radio vendors do Dash 7. There's a few who are also su supplying desks to the, to the TV wor world, but radio do has been doing IP for a while. It's pretty established, it's, it's settled, it doesn't need fiber speed, and it doesn't do Dash 7. So we have to think about more conventional striping of connections onto switches and so on, and you can't get that into the Dash 7 dual network. It just doesn't go. So you very quickly realize that you're throwing money after a, a bad solution by trying to force them together, and you're better off running the audio on a separate network that's properly designed for the sort of equipment in play. The other area, within post-production for audio monitoring, we've got all these edit suites, don't forget, have got um, quite a lot of them got surround speakers fitted. They all need various AMUs to have audio feeds fed to them. And that, in the main, is uh, Dante equipment. That's uh, the design choices we've made on the selection of vendors there drives us down the route of Dante. At the point when we had to lock this design down, and it's something that's changed since, but hey, we are where we are, Dante wouldn't work with PTP v2. That's not true now. You can get it to do that. Um, it, 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 it's complicated. I've got my network specialist waving at me in the background. You know, he's available for hire on the next project for fixing these problems. But um, we, we decided it was simplest to keep network uh, for Dante separate, and that allows us to run PTP v1 in there as necessary and isolate it from PTP v2. You can't really bring both versions together on PTP capable switches and not expect some fun and games. So we've got to find ways of bringing the audio between the two networks. And that's done with various links through the GV nodes. So the GV nodes kind of do a format conversion. They're the boundary between things on the 2110-7 presentation and then the AS67 and Dante presentation. They do adaptation. And the control of that has been a lot of the headaches over the last year. So the control methodology that we've got Separate control network, which is um, completely isolated from our business network, and it's divided into, in simple terms, a VLAN per system. And within each VLAN, then we can accept broadcast vendors who may be not quite as up to date with the best practice of information security as we'd like, but we contain them within VLANs, and we only allow the traffic to flow between the VLANs, which is necessary, which is primarily our BMCS control data going to each individual system. So in this case, the, the example of the live core, it's going to GV Convergent. But we don't allow, for example, GV Convergent to talk to the um, radio microphones or to the sound desks. Each lives in its own isolated bubble. And the big change we've had from previous uh, installation within BBC sites is that perceived wisdom in the past was to fit and forget and isolate and air gap the control PCs on things like BNCS. And, and leave them alone, keep them isolated, they won't give us any trouble. Well, we now know the best practice is not that, and you, you do get trouble. People plug in USB sticks, random DSL lines appear for an urgent update or something, and that's where the troubles begin. That's how things get into your network. But because it was isolated, you never bother to put in the monitoring tools. So what we've done is consciously build in the mechanisms to update our networks over um, WSIS updates, um, we've got um, monitoring tools, so our, media, our management networks are now much more integrated for monitoring, but they're still isolated from our business networks via another firewall. So the way this works for our live core is BNCS is what the users use, it talks to GV Convergent, GV Convergent talks to Cisco DCNM to set up the flow policies. GV Convergent connects to GV devices using various GV APIs. We wanted to use ISO 4 and ISO 5 from MMOS all the way through all the non-GV devices. But, and this I actually feel like it's a bit of a, uh, it's unfair to put this line here at the bottom of the slide because I've come over here and actually things have moved on a long way, but the point in time where we had to lock down our designs wasn't quite ready. So we've had some problems with NTP, which, with, uh, uh, MOS rather, which we've had to deal with. PTP is another area that everyone gets worried about. It, it comes at a cost and you have to spend the money on your master clocks and on your switches to get the capabilities there. 
Um, we've gone with Mindberg switches. We've got two, actually we've got a third, which monitors the other two, will tell, them, tell us if they drift. And they connect in using this architecture here. There's kind of about three or four architectures doing the rounds. Um, the jury's out which one will work best longer term. But what you can't do is just drop it in at the bottom of the spine leaf network and expect it to behave flawlessly. You need to give it some consideration. So this is one exception where we do actually bridge the A and B networks and we bring it in through what we're calling feeder switches. That then gives us a hook to get PTP to other systems. All our switches are boundary clock capable and that comes at a cost, but it takes away a lot of the worry about PTP. Some of the audio issues, um, I've talked about already the fact that radio vendors have a different methodology, a different mindset around resilience and don't adopt Dash 7. There's also all the different profiles to think about. We settled on uh, profile C, 125 microseconds, 16 channel, for the audio that goes with the video, and one millisecond, uh, one to eight channel, AS67 for the radio, and that's just based on best practice we've had between our selected vendors. But you've got to get between them. You've got to figure out a way of getting between them. Um, I think I've covered most of the rest of that, but you know, we've, we've actually had to use a bit more MADI than perhaps we thought we would at the outset, but MADI, don't forget, is a decent firewall between the systems, and we're using some quite clever control of the GV nodes to move audio around and basically shuffle it between the two worlds. That's a complicated drawing of how it all, all comes together. I won't linger on this. Um, if people want to talk to me about it afterwards or look, download the slides, you can see we're using quite a lot of MADI for monitoring because our radio transmission is still baseband, so we have to monitor that, and you can't have multiple different speakers and multiple different headphones in the MCR. So we have to bring it together, and we use MADI as that final monitoring position. And then you can see there something, for example, the Calrec desks are connected both to the AS67 network and to the live core, because they need both flavours of audio coming into them. So the audio is where all our complexity has been. There's stuff on there that's too small to read, but when you download it, you can see it. So Interop, we, we engaged DB Broadcast as our systems integrator, what, two years ago now, something like that? And it's been a non-stop slog to do all the integration testing. So they've run through, I've mentioned a lot of these brands already, so um, you know, we, we tested and qualified all these against our core system. Um, and have then gone through various rounds of updates and refreshes and modifications to get it all working. And these are all the things that we have integrated into our system. Um, so, pretty good range of different vendors we've managed to get. I, I think, and the message I'm taking away from walking around the show over the last few days is it's getting bigger, that pool of people where 2110 is just established now. So, NMOS, probably the main problems we've had around NMOS. Um, we set a deadline in November 18 to get NMOS ISO 4 and ISO 5 interop working. And then we extended that to March, and then we extended it again to April. So we really wanted this to work. We gave it all the time we possibly could to get this to work, and it just hasn't come good. Some vendors are there, some vendors are. I'm not going to call out individuals. Um, go around and, um, and draw your own conclusions. I have to say, looking around the show now, quietly, there's a little revolution going on. The ISO 4 and ISO 5 are just there. They've just come together. People have got it and figured it out. But the time when we had to lock the design down, it wasn't quite there. So we put a lot of work in it, and then the program board just had to draw a line on it. And we've had to um, use some um, fixes to get around that on the next slide, which, which allow us to get around it. The thing I will call out from here, um, there's different approaches. A lot of them are probably settling now, but we found some people did inbound, some people are out, out of band, some people did MDNS, some people, which doesn't work in our routed network, by the way, and some people did DNS SD. Um, the plug fests got hijacked by marketing, so you've got a better sense of readiness than the real engineering case was. was, was. But the recent work with the JTNM Qualified has probably addressed that pretty effectively, and, and, and we can now believe on that. But you know, early days of this, I think there was a slightly mixed message. It's very hard to understand what NMOS does, so it's easy for it to get muddled in the messaging for, from a sales point of view. Um, so yeah, this is perhaps slightly unfair, having walked around the last two days, but when we locked down, NMOS was giving us trouble. And the way we got around it, um, we use it where we can, and, and where we can't, we are basically natting. We're going through UCP cards working as a turnaround device, so we have a rooted part of the flow and a fixed part of the flow. That, as NMOS matures, as we can update firmware and take NMOS from some of our other vendors, we can take that out, move those cards somewhere else, use them for something different. So it's an annoyance, but it's, it's necessary. Picture on the right there. Oh, by the way, all the pictures as we're going through are on site. They're things that deployed. That's the MCR. All the pictures you see there are 2110. That's taken a couple of weeks ago. It's all working. Um, lessons learned from the testing. Interoperability testing, absolutely vital. 
need the SI engaged and keyed up for this at an early stage. You're going to need new skills, you're going to need new test equipment. That's now settled. When we started out, we didn't even know what test equipment we needed, but you know, there's obvious choices now. You need to use formal testing techniques like Jira and TestRail. Systems are complicated. There's lots of layers where the fault can be. It could be as simple as a dirty fiber or something unplugged, or it could be a hugely complicated software problem. And it's really easy to miss the configuration errors. Um, and testing takes longer than you thought. Always it takes longer than you thought. Things keeping us awake. Um, MMOS has been a problem. We've worked our way around it. I wish we were further forward than we are. Next project, we will be. You know, we've moved everything on for the next BBC IP build. Configuration is hugely complicated. We, um, the guys in Canada are doing a lot of work around things like Ansible, sort of automation tools to build the config. The vendors aren't really there yet, um, and it ends up with a huge amount of man hours spent typing things in. Um, and every API is a bit different. Every system has a different config tool set. So it needs a lot of effort. So the developments we're seeing from the likes of the EB are helping move that forward. And the equipment availability is still limited. One of the weirdnesses we found when we set out is you weren't seeing single stream UHD. So we're having to actually still route quad through the IP, which is a, anachronistic, but it is what it is. And audio, as I've mentioned quite a lot, has been a problem for us, but I think we're pretty much on the home run now with making it work. Final slide, then thoughts on 2110 readiness. It's, it's beyond promises to be the go-to standard. I should update this slide. It is the go-to standard. It's working. The video just works. The audio, once you crack some of the interrupt stuff, just works. The control needs more, more effort and, and is still where some of the troubles lie. Um, I would say the only, op the only problem with it is the number of options, the number of different profiles, narrow, wide, different audio profiles and so on. You've got to pick your house standard and lock into it and then get everyone to comply with that. We need more on the configuration and management tools. It's simply taking too much engineer effort from us and our suppliers and our SI to, to pull it together. MMOS still needs to come together, but I think there's a clear direction of travel on that that we're seeing that's really positive. The more people that do this, the better it gets. That's the, the end message. We've, we've had an interesting couple of years pulling this on. It's been fun some of the time, painful some of the time. But we're on the home run now. We'll be going live in the new year, and it's going to look absolutely fantastic. And actually, a lot of people won't even know it's IP. And that's a measure of success. So I think that's all I've got to say. All right, Mark, thank you very much. <laughs> Just um, want to remind everybody that we will be posting these uh, videos uh, as soon as we get a chance at uh, vsf.tv. Also, uh, please make sure that you have your uh, badge scanned at the front here so that we can uh, send you a link so you can get a, a copy of the presentation um, to see you know, some of the fine print on what, what Mark wrote. Um, I have time for one very short question. Anybody has one? Can I ask not from one of my colleagues, please? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hi there. Just interested in the time scale and how much, uh, how, uh, how much did the project overrun from your original time scale? The project hasn't overrun. The project is on time. Um, you know, looking at like, where we set out our timetable, we were always going to go on, on to migration sometime between Q4 2019 and Q1 2020. And yeah, we're towards the end of that block, but we're in time. We're on time. We're on budget. Um, that doesn't mean there's not been a lot of hard work behind the scenes to keep us there. You know, a lot of long days to do it. But, yeah, we're on, we're on track. Outstanding. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll have our next presenter up in a minute or two.